next item is, is a little bit long, but this is a, something that we face quite frequently. So we just finished the first week of our two-day preseason workouts for field hockey. I hadn't seen my teammate, Mary, for three months. She said at the end of the last season that she really wanted to improve her fitness level over the break. When she came back, it looked like she had lost 30 to 40 pounds. She was a little overweight before, but now she looks good, maybe a little too thin. At the start of the week, she was one of the first ones to finish the mile and the sprints. However, I noticed by the end of the week, she's beginning to drag. She always has an excuse not to go out to lunch with us, even when we visit her favorite sandwich place. I'm concerned she may not be eating enough. What should I do? Should I confront her? Should I take her out to lunch? I'm really worried about her. One of the things that is guaranteed to make somebody, if they're having an eating disorder or food issues, guaranteed to make their anxiety go up is you confront them directly about their food. First thing they're going to go is, I mean, because if that's what you're, if that's what you're phobic about and you bring it up, that brings up the anxiety. So the best way of approaching somebody, I think, when you're worried about them is to say, you know, I'm, I'm worried about you. What is something going on? You were, you, you, you don't seem yourself. You're tired. Um, you don't seem happy. And try to avoid the idea of food or weight, because again, an eating disorder is not about food or weight. That is the that is the bad side effect, um, and that tends to keep them from putting up immediately putting up those barriers and going, "No, I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. I'm fine." Uh, so that's usually what I suggest people do. Are you feeling okay? Is there anything going on? Are you upset about something? Something's you know I'm, I'm worried about you. Uh, the thing, the thing not to do is ignore it, and I, I love that advice. That you know, if we talk about it as a phobia, and you you go to your friend and say, "Hey, let's go to the 15th floor on on with on, in, in this elevator," and you have an elevator phobia, you know, you're not going to say, "That's a great idea. Let's let's go." And so, if someone has a food phobia, and you start talking to them about their eating habits and eating patterns, you're going to get a lot of pushback, and you might get a lot of anger because you're you're poking the anxiety and making it making it worse, and so. One of the things that's very clear, people with eating disorders are not happy. Uh, they're, they're, they, they might smile and they might pretend that they're happy, but really at their core, they're, they're, they're not happy. And I think that's a much gentler approach to take. Saying, I'm noticing certain things. I'm noticing that you're not very happy. I notice such and such. I'm not necessarily go after the food immediately. Uh, however, even if they push back or they deny and you continue to have concerns, it's imperative that you don't, you don't back off. One of the things that is my mission in life is to talk about that one out of 10 of these patients die. And it has the highest death rate among all psychological disorders. 30% of the people who die commit suicide. So it has a very high suicide rate. This is not a vanity issue. This is not my butt's too big and I want to lose weight. These are severe mental illnesses that, that need treatment. And we, we know as treatment providers that the sooner they come into treatment and the sooner they get into the right type of treatment, the more likely they are to get better and the quicker they are to get, the more likely they are to get better quickly. And so it's, you know, the, the friends that, that you have or, or your roommates, those are the folks that if they're struggling that, that I think you have an obligation to, to talk to them and be persistent in, in your quest to give them help. Because they're hoping you'll just forget about it and just leave them alone. Um, one of the first things I'll tell people is, okay, even if you think nothing's wrong, just for my sake, why don't you go over to the health center or go to the doctor and get checked out and make sure you're not sick? Because, you know, a doctor's hopefully going to at least pick up some immediate medical instability. Um, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, um, <coughs> blood chemistry panel, those kinds of things that obviously a doctor can pick up because the first concern is, is this person safe or do they need to be in the hospital? And if you drop weight too fast and if you are purging, you can be, you can, you can drop dead at any minute. Heart attack. Yeah, mm -hmm. heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, were there times, I remember some times where, um, your family had to talk you into going over to the ER. No. What? How did they talk you into doing that? I don't think it was more of what they were saying. It was actually after um, they had they had brought it up to me. I noticed that I was starting to feel symptoms. 
and sorry, um, and it was really good that I went because one of the times um, they hooked me up to Ivy's and my doctor came and saw me the next morning and told me that I didn't go, I would have died. I wouldn't have made it through. If I would have fell asleep, I wouldn't have woken up. And that's how severe it is. It gets really bad. And so that's why it's really important, you know, to, you know, don't follow them to the bathroom. Don't do stuff like that because that's going to just make them go the opposite way. Um, the best thing to do is like Heather is saying, just keep on being persistent. Keep on saying, you know, I noticed the difference in you, your personality, you're angry, you're the B word. I mean, <laughs> you got You just got to keep on being persistent because I still have friends out there that deal with this every day and I can't hold their hand and make them go to the hospital. But if I keep on going over and over again, finally, maybe something will click in their head and they'll realize, okay, maybe I do have an issue. So it's really important, just keep on going, keep on being persistent. Did you go to the ER voluntarily? Uh, or did somebody have to go over and talk you into going? Uh, which time? <laughs> <laughs> um, finally, my mother, I think she was probably the biggest one. She, she broke down really bad. And she's my life, and seeing how upset and seeing what I was doing to her made me realize that I needed to do something and change for myself and for my family. And so, yeah, there was times where I had to have to call 911 and they had to come and get me. Or there was times where I felt like I really needed to go and I made myself go. So, I mean, there was both times. I mean, there was times where I was forced and there was times where I felt like there was something wrong. You can, you can just tell, you can feel it. Again, it's don't, if you think, you may just be a roommate, but if, you know, most of you who are students, that means your family isn't here. So your family are the people that live with you. And even if you may not be friends with your roommates, <laughs> even if maybe some of their, I mean, some of the common behaviors of somebody who's going into an eating disorder is they isolate themselves, they get irritable, they get the B word. The B word. Um, <laughs> They, they, you don't want to be around them because they're not acting very nice and, they're, and they are so caught up in the illness that they're focusing on when am I going to eat, when am I not going to eat, how am I going to purge, they don't have room to think of anything else. So if you see somebody who's feeling, feeling sick and they're never getting out and they're, and they're wasting away, don't just say, well, I hope they do something. Call, you know, call the RA, call the uh, call 911. Well, I've called 911 to my office when I've said, You aren't leaving here, I'm giving you a choice. I'm going to either call, you know, your parent or your spouse, and they're going to come and drive you home, or, all right, what I told her was, or we can call the really cute firemen that are down the street <laughs> in the firehouse and they'll come check you out. So she chose the, the cute firemen. Um, <laughs> Because that's who I really wanted, because I knew they would immediately take all of her vitals and stuff. Um, but don't worry about making them mad at you. It's sort of like if, I'm sure you've probably heard about it, if you think somebody's suicidal, don't worry about their feelings, worry about their life. And I think it can be the same thing with this. Mary denies she has a problem. How do you determine if a person has an eating disorder or is naturally thin? <laughs> Send them to the doctor. The doctor and get an evaluation. I think too, you, I mean you, if it's someone that you're close to, you've been around them for a really long time, you can notice eating habits, you can notice fears of food, avoiding certain situations, you can, you can notice very, you know. Constant trips to the bathroom. Yeah, constant trips to the bathroom, usually right after someone eats. Um, if you always notice that, you know, a lot of people do go to the bathroom after they eat, so you know, but, but if you notice all these, th these common signs together, then you probably have an eating disorder versus someone who's naturally thin. Now there are people who are naturally thin, but you have, and eating disorders don't necessarily mean thinness either. I think that that's a big point as well, is um, a lot of things that happen, people don't call because they're like, oh, she looked okay, you know? And, and 
that's not really the biggest symptom. In fact, a lot of um, more recent patients have come to us after a great weight loss, um, you know, like of 20 to 30 pounds, and they may have been slightly overweight. So when they come to us, they look normal. They don't, you know, it's not like a big sign or something, but they are extremely sick. Some of my patients who are of no normal weight are more sick than any of my patients who are underweight. And so that's really not a good barometer. It's more of, are you seeing changes in their behaviors? Are you seeing changes in their eating habits? Are they, are they avoiding certain situations? Um, you know, as people, when we have connections to each other, you can kind of just tell when something's up, right? Like, if your sister's not doing well, you can tell. And so if you have that feeling, sitting down and having that conversation of something's changed isn't gonna hurt. In fact, maybe they're waiting to tell you something. I think, too, you'll notice uh, more rigid behaviors, uh, fewer uh, choices around food, meaning their food variety gets more limited. Uh, the eating disorder is progressive in the sense that it's not stagnant, it doesn't stay in the same place, it, it gets gradually worse. And so you'll see a worsening of, of symptoms that, you know, where before they would eat a variety of different foods for breakfast, they're now down to a half a bagel for breakfast. And, then when you pose to them, hey, why don't you try such and such, you'll notice a pretty strong reaction. No, nope, I'm sticking with my, my half a bagel. So the rigid, their behavior and their thinking becomes more rigid, and they're not, real, they're not willing to be flexible at all. 